Canada is currently in the throes of a Marxist takeover. This has been happening for the last four years with very few willing to mount a defensive fight against it. But for many, the latest historical assassination of Henry Dundas, and that's what it is by the way, the character assassination of a great man in history has woken many people up. Socialist Mayor of Toronto, Olivia Chow, with the backing of a majority of Toronto City Councillors, just voted to erase Henry Dundas from Toronto. The council renamed Young Dundas Square to Sankofa Square. They've also voted to rename the two Dundas stations, and of course the entirety of Dundas Street will also be renamed. The charge against Henry Dundas was that he perpetuated the transatlantic slave trade. That is a lie. Everyone knows it to be a lie, but that's not actually the point. Just like Egerton Ryerson and just like John A. Macdonald, Henry Dundas represents what Marxists are trying to destroy, Canada itself. They want you to believe that Canada was built on slavery, racism, and genocide. Canada is what they seek to erase. That is why our churches, a symbol of Canada as a Christian country, are being burned to the ground. That's why our elected office holders voted to condemn Canada as a genocidal country. That is why our statues are being toppled. And that's why great men of history who shaped this country are being erased. As Karl Marx wrote, in bourgeois society, the past dominates the present. In communist society, the present dominates the past. Drop a like in the video, help us out by subscribing to the True North YouTube channel, stick around for an interview with a living relative of Henry Dundas, and the comment question for the episode is this. Who will the Marxists erase next? Let me know in the comments, and let's get into it. Henry Dundas was an abolitionist. He committed his life to abolishing the slave trade. That's why Canada honors him. That's why we celebrate him across our country today. The charge against Dundas is that he perpetuated the slave trade across the empire. This is not true. William Wilberforce, also an abolitionist, sought to immediately abolish the slave trade in the late 1700s. His legislation was never going to pass. So Dundas, as the Home Secretary of the United Kingdom in 1792, amended the legislation to gradually abolish the slave trade. That amendment was passed, 230 to 85 votes, setting in motion the eventual abolition of slavery in 1833. What's more is that Dundas was the man who commissioned John Graves Simcoe to be the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. In 1793, Simcoe, who was also an abolitionist, convinced the Assembly of Upper Canada to accept his Gradual Abolition Act, and just like that, Upper Canada became the first territory in the Empire to pass such a bill. It immediately banned the import of slaves into Upper Canada. Any person who set foot in Upper Canada from that point onwards was a free person. That is why we honor Henry Dundas, and that is why we celebrate John Graves Simcoe. These men were ahead of their time. They virtuously and justly administered their authority. Now this has nothing to do with slavery. We know that because the council chose Sankofa to be the word that now occupies the title of Young Dundas Square. Sankofa was a word coined by the Akan tribe of Ghana, who themselves traded slaves for gold. This is about canceling Canada as a project. Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book rewritten. Every picture has been repainted. Every statue and street building has been renamed. Every date has been altered. And the process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. Sound familiar? That was in George Orwell's dystopian fiction 1984. So what is really the motivation behind all of this? Why does an African word now occupy the title of Canada's most iconic intersection? Why is John A. Macdonald's statue at Queen's Park in a wooden box as some sort of national humiliation ritual? Why are statues of our greatest monarchs violently torn down on Canada Day and celebrated by elected politicians? Why do our churches get burned down? Why did our flags fly at half mass for over six months? It's simple. They are trying to demoralize you. They are trying to beat the will to defend your country out of you. They change the lyrics to our anthem, sing it in foreign languages, erect giant unseemly statues in front of you, and import millions of people who are unwilling to accept Canadian values and to assimilate into our country because the people in charge clearly hate this country. In the words of Justin Trudeau, they want Canada to be the first post-national state, regardless of what Canadians actually might think about that. Well, joining us now is a distant living relative of Henry Dundas, Jennifer Dundas. She's a former Crown Prosecutor and also a former CBC journalist. 
Over the past few years, she has spent a considerable amount of time debunking the lies about Henry Dundas and trying to mount a just defense of not just Henry Dundas, but also other historical figures in this country as well. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks for inviting me, Harrison. So why don't we first begin by just addressing these charges? You've written a lot about why Dundas is not guilty of what he's being accused of. But why don't you first address the charges, this accusation that Henry Dundas was involved in perpetuating the transatlantic slave trade? That's something that virtually every historian of British history has said is an, is an unfair accusation, that it was impossible to achieve abolition of the slave trade during the 1790s when there were so many forces lined up against it. Those included the House of Lords, the royal family, and very powerful economic interests who controlled many of the MPs in the House of Commons. Um, Even the most anti-Dundas historians would say that's the case. And and the leading anti-Dundas historian who has one peer-reviewed column to his name also says that. So for Toronto to continue to perpetuate this this lie is, is... really uh, showing a lack of integrity and respect for historical accuracy. That's the main one. Uh, And then to say that he was in the pockets of the slave traders and the owners of plantations in the West Indies, also totally not true. There was a peer-reviewed article that came from another scholar of British history uh, just a few months ago who unearthed some new documents in the archives in the UK And they show that the planters in the West Indies saw Henry Dundas as as their opponent, along with William Wilberforce. In fact, they referred to him as uh, equally um, their opponent. Uh, And they they told their agent in London that they needed to defeat the plans of both of them, Wilberforce for immediate abolition or Henry Dundas for a more gradual process. They were opposed to both. And Henry Dundas was a close friend of William Wilberforce's. Well, maybe not close, but they were neighbors. They frequently socialized together. There are many, many references in Wilberforce's journals to very happy times spent with Henry Dundas at his home, staying overnight, even just you know a few days before Christmas, spending two or three days at his home. Um, so to say that he was aligned with those interests is, is simply not true. And, and historians will agree that um, the case against him is based on very flimsy evidence. So obviously, this name change has nothing to do with slavery because the, the term Sankofa comes from the Akan tribe who sold slaves and traded slaves for gold. If it had anything to do with slavery, they might have picked something else. So the question I have for you, Jennifer, is is why are they doing this? What is the motivation behind this? I I don't understand why they didn't do more research into that name. It it kind of smacks of a a rushed decision at the very end because they made the decision to choose this name, the committee that was appointed to do this, on Tuesday night. And then the motion came before council on Thursday last week. And that was at the same time that Lydia Chow was putting together these other things around a bailout from the province and then approving the name of Rob Ford Stadium as well. So all these things were happening together. And so it looks like they just said, okay, we we need to do this now. Which one are we going to pick? Okay, this one sounds the best. Um, I I mean, I think it's kind of shocking, really, because they did have... um, historian from the University of Toronto who specializes in Atlantic slavery studies uh, who ought to have known about this certainly should have or or maybe they didn't care I'm not sure really what was going on there but I can tell you if they had for example chosen an Ojibwe name for the square um, that would have been taken as honoring the Ojibwe people so to take the name, or take a, a, a word from this tribe in Africa, in Ghana, and use that honors that tribe in the same right. way we would by, by choosing indigenous names. And so to say it has nothing to do with slavery, it's just a name, it's just a language that um, you know a, a small group of African people spoke, it, it just doesn't stand up. They didn't think it through. 
it's it's remarkable. Yeah, it's astonishing. But it also feels as though, I mean, in the case of Ryerson University, they didn't rename uh, Ryerson University to uh, to after someone who themselves partook in in such a, in a in the residential school system. They just erased Egerton Ryerson from history, despite him being a fundamentally good man, despite the actual facts backing up the claims that he was not what he is accused of. And the same can be said for Dundas, in my opinion, that Dundas is not guilty of what he's being accused of. In fact, the opposite. But he just stands in, as history stands in the way of what a lot of people are seeking to do, to, in my opinion, to erase part of, uh, part of what is uh, Canadian history. Because, of course, as I mentioned before this, Dundas appointed John Graves Simcoe, who passed the first bill in the empire that essentially set in motion the abolition of slavery. So again, it, it's remarkable. I have to ask you, uh, Jennifer, you're a former CBC journalist, and I think the media plays a key role in this. Not doing any digging, not doing any research, and just accepting the facts that are being presented to us by people who have a political interest in changing these names. What do you make of how the really the, the mainstream media in this country haven't done their homework and haven't actually reported the facts, the truth about Dundas, but instead have basically handheld this process of eliminating people from history. It's, it has really shocked me uh, to be on this side of what the media is doing and, and trying to get the ear of, of key people in the mainstream media. Because as you mentioned before, I was a journalist before. I, I worked for the CBC, before that for the Canadian press. And so I had 20 years of experience under my belt, uh, a lot of which was as a political affairs reporter. And it just shocked me to see what people would do uh, with the information that we were presenting. They would either ignore it or they would distort, they would take a quote that would be out of context and, and not really convey what it was we were saying if we did ever manage to get their attention, which was very rare. It was so difficult that I actually went to the ombudsman of a couple of major uh, news outlets in Toronto to complain that, look, we're providing all of this information that shows that what you're printing is inaccurate and no one will pay any attention to it. You know, can you please do something about this? And in both cases, we, we just got to brush off. It's like, thank you for letting us know. We will certainly keep this in mind going forward. And then they didn't. Of course. <laughs> um, it, it, to me, it looked like they just thought that this was a, a narrative that advanced the rights of people who deserved to have their rights respected. And so to undermine that was something they were just reluctant to do. So what shocked me was they were really putting themselves in the role of, of activists in a way and, and not journalists. They weren't being fair and balanced. The idea of balance when it came into their stories was you know, people saying we have to change the name because of this horrible person who delayed the abolition of the slave trade. And then on the other side would be a business person saying, no, I can't afford it. You know, it was nothing to do with the underlying facts, which were patently false in many, many cases. Um, you know, they would take a, bits and pieces, you know, cherry picking through bits of evidence in history to, to build a case. And, and, I mean, you're a storyteller, I'm a storyteller. We all know that if you want to tell a certain story, you can find ways to tell that story. And I just saw that happening over and over again um, in, in a way that was really appalling to me. I really felt that the media was letting people down. It was an interesting story what our committee was doing. We were a committee of, uh, we started out mostly family members uh, with the Dundas name. Uh, but we were soon joined by other people who were very concerned about what was going on in their communities across southern Ontario. There was Dundas, Ontario, London, Ontario, Whitby, Woodstock, Ingersoll, many places that had the name Dundas in uh, their locations. Um, and they're very concerned about this sweeping across the province. So we had historians, um, just local people who were interested, who, who offered to help and it became a very interesting project to, to work on with these people. And I think that's a great story. You know, even if, even if they thought we were wrong or off base or, or if we were racist or whatever, it was still an interesting story. We weren't, of course. We were interested in historical integrity and having the truth told about Henry Dundas. But we were just seen as, oh, you can't trust what they're saying. It's just the family. 
And uh, yeah, it was super disappointing. Even the Toronto Star, I spent a lot of time with the Toronto Star for one major spread that they did a few months ago. And the only quote they took from everything I told them about the history of Henry Dundas was to say, we're not racists. <laughs> you know, it's like, say, what? yeah, it was so disappointing. Yeah. So the last question I have for you, Jennifer, is who's next on the historical chopping block? Um, you know, we even have towns of Simcoe as well. Simcoe himself was an abolitionist, a hard charge to try and uh, defeat. But who's next? Because I know that it's not just going to stop at Dundas. We've already seen it. Well, you know what? Staff will not let that information slip. Um, staff, in my view and my experience, have been devious about this from the start. And they were, they're not going to tip their hand in a way that's going to prejudice their ability to get the changes they want on the urban landscape, the geographical history of Toronto. They have their list of things that they want to do and they will do it and then they will spring it on the public without notice as they have done all along. Like they had, they promised in the beginning, they promised, I mean, they set out a plan for public consultation in the beginning, which council approved. So council approved the decision to rename the street on the basis of this plan that staff put forward, which was based on broad public consultation, town halls, email, um, a phone in line, uh, just various meetings, various opportunities for the public to have their say. They hired a consultant who said, oh no, don't do that because you'll just get a bunch of racists coming out of the woodwork and it'll just be ugly and hurtful to the, the black population of the city. So instead of going to council or even the mayor and saying, look, we have this advice, we think it's not a good idea to go ahead with public consultation now, what would you advise? They just canceled it. And they didn't tell council, they didn't tell the public, they didn't tell anybody except their small circle of insiders that public consultation was off the table. So then the next thing that happened was they approve the... Uh, the recommendation to rename the street and what's supposed to happen is this community advisory committee will put together a short list of names and then the public will have the opportunity to comment on the short list of names. So again, we were, we didn't think they would try and pull this again, stunt again. So we're waiting for the opportunity to comment on the names and, and use that as a way to further bring attention to what we were saying. Um, and instead, what they did was they came forward without a staff report, which is very irregular for a project that's been in the works for over three years on such a controversial and important issue. Uh, they brought it on in as a walk-on motion, a no-notice motion uh, to council and took everybody by surprise, the public and even other councillors. So councillors were then in a position of not being able to debate the motion. They just had to use their five minutes to get some very basic information about what was behind the motion and get the details and then make a decision on, on how to vote. It wasn't fair to anybody and it was anti-democratic because they had promised pub public consultation and they used, they, it was an abusive process in my view to put this before council as an urgent matter. I mean, they knew this was coming for how long and now all of a sudden it's urgent and the budget process is going to extend for another two months. It was just another lie, basically. There was nothing urgent about that motion, but it was a way to avoid um, jeopardizing what they wanted to do, because if they had put it before council in the normal course, what would have happened was members of the public could have made written submissions and come in to make personal uh, deputations to council. Right, uh, right. And, and so all of those opportunities were lost and well, uh, yeah. it Just was railroaded. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, deeply, deeply undemocratic, sinister. I think our audience can see where this is all headed. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. Where can our audience find your work and, and find you on social media? 
Uh, we do have a website, well, it's a blog, that has a, a lot of information and articles about uh, various aspects of Henry Dundas broken down into bite-sized pieces, but also with a link to a larger paper that we've, a research paper that we've done that has all the links to the underlying evidence that we've relied on. And it also sets out um, and provides links to leading authorities, leading historians around the world and, and in Toronto and Canada who have commented on this. It's at uh, the website medium.com and we are HD, so Henry Dundas Committee, HD Committee. Um, dot medium dot com I think that's that's how it goes but if you go to medium dot com and and look for HD committee or Henry Dundas committee you'll find us there um, and I'm on um, X uh, these days uh, under uh, the uh, handle JL Dundas so you can find some information there as well great and our audience can find a link to that medium website in the description of this video Jennifer thanks again for coming on Thank you for inviting me, Faulkner, and, and thank you for your questions. It was, uh, it was good to, to be able to talk about some of that stuff, which no one's asked about before. <laughs> Great. My pleasure. Thank you again. Thanks. All right, everyone, that's going to do it for us today on the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Reminder to let me know your answer to the comment question of this video. Who are the Marxists going to erase next? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Harrison Faulkner, and this is Ratioed.